Ah, our God is willing to do. Our God is able to do. We're serving a God of miracles. You know, some people wonder. They'll say, if there really is a God, why do terrible things happen? We have the answers. But the only thing is that sometimes, do people really want the answers? Or do, really want, do, they, do, really want the, do they really have the time to listen? Praise the Lord. Miracles are a proof of God's love. Miracles are a proof of God's intervention. What we need to know how to do is how to receive miracles. And the greatest miracle has been done for us. Everything that we require, Jesus has already done. And God has already done. We just need to find out. Praise the Lord. You know, I've shared the story before. And because of time, I won't share it again. But we, we, we ourselves have heard so many stories of people who had something precious and valuable with them, but they didn't know. Some others didn't know how to use it. I, for one, for example, I've had books in my house that I have not read. And then one day I said, okay, let me read them. I'm talking about Christian books. I said, let me read this book. And when I read the book, there were so many answers in that book just for me. But the book had been in my house all this, all this time. So a lot, of, a lot of times it's not whether God has done something or not done something. It's whether if you, if you have found out what God has done and how to take a hold of it for yourself. There are many people that might die today and not go to heaven. Why? Not because Jesus didn't die for them. Not because Jesus didn't save them. It's because either they heard and did not believe or they did not hear. But God has done it all. That's why we're, we're called witnesses. We are the ones that have to tell people what Brother Chooks did today was being a witness. He just came and witnessed what God had done for him. This is what God did for me. Praise the Lord. You know, in the Bible, in John chapter 5, John tells a story of a place in Jerusalem called the Five Porches, Bethesda. And there was a pool there. And the Bible says, from time to time, an angel would come and steer the water. And the first person that entered into the water after the stirring of the water, would be healed of any affliction, any ailment, whatever form it was. So they, would, so they had a lot of people, sick people, there, waiting for the stirring. So it, it, it means it didn't happen every day. Probably didn't happen every week. Maybe, and it wasn't, it wasn't a regular thing. It was a regular thing. People would know when to get there. Do you get it? So it was, it was something that was irregular, but it happened. And they were just there waiting for the stirring of the water. You know what that, that told me? Because then there were no healings before Jesus came. There was a time that there were no miracles, there were no prophecies, there were no revelations, there were no visions. From the time of Malachi to when Jesus came, Israel had no, no prophets. You know, John came, John was the forerunner of Jesus. It was when John came, and that, it was almost 500 years. Imagine, almost 500 years for people that are called the people of God not to hear from God. Not to see miracles, not to see signs, not to see any of those things. And, but it let me know that God will find a way to bring help. Even when the people, people are not even believing. That, that story just let me know. He said, okay, there's no prophets, there's nobody here that believes, but this one, let me do it for them. Praise the Lord. That's why sometimes I, you know, when you hear some strange stories that you say that there's a fountain somewhere, maybe in France or a fountain somewhere in South America, when people go there at certain times, they get healed. I believe it. I believe it. Because God always seeks to bring help to people. That's the God we serve. Praise the Lord. So, 
last Sunday, we had a miracle service. Things happened. God touched us. Praise the Lord. We had the, our More Than Music gospel concert. It was absolutely amazing. Some people were just <laughs> in another dimension. You know, something was just happening to some people. They were lost in God. Praise the Lord. And then we now had a wonderful service on Sunday and we prayed for ourselves. We prayed for others. And then we received the outpouring of God's Spirit. Praise the Lord. So I said that we're going to look at how, how, to, receive, how to keep our miracle. Because you know, some people lose it. So we're going to look at some, some reasons why people lose their miracles and what you can do about it. You know, I've, I've, I've been at crusades and I've watched on, on videos, crusades of Pastor Chris, where sometimes he ministers to people and when he, he's talking to them, they say, oh, pastor, pray for me that this miracle will be permanent. How many of you have heard people say that? Pray for me that it will be permanent. See, it's not the pastor's place to pray for you that your miracle will be permanent. It's not. It's not even God's place to make the miracle permanent in your life. It's your own place. Now let's look at what the Bible says. John chapter 5 verse 14. You know, I just shared uh, this, this story of the pool of Bethesda. And one day, Jesus went there. And when he went there, he spoke to only one man. And when he spoke to that man, the Bible says the man had been in that condition for 38 years. The Bible says he was impotent. In other words, he was completely paralyzed. He couldn't move. That word impotent means powerless. That's what it means. He couldn't move at all. Completely paralyzed. And then when Jesus went to him, you know the question Jesus asked him? He said, do you want to be well? Isn't that a strange question? First of all, you're surrounded by sick people. You would think that some sick people want to be well. You know? And uh, I personally have met people that don't want to be well. There are people I wanted to pray for. I, don't, I remember some years ago, I wanted to pray for a lady. She had issues with her nerves. She had some other issues. And I wanted to, you know, I shared the word of God with her. And I wanted to pray for her. And she said, no, don't pray for me. Because I don't want to be healed. Because if I get healed, I'll lose my benefits. So, I had never heard that before. You can imagine the shock I felt. I thought everyone wanted to be well. But that day I found out different. So maybe that's why Jesus asked this man, <laughs> do you want to be well? But when he asked the man the question, the man's response. You know, you know we say people pray. But when people pray, not everyone gets results when they pray. Because we don't know what the content of their prayer is. And the Bible says that if we pray according to his will, he hears us. So what happens if we don't pray according to his will? He doesn't hear. But the Bible says that this is the confidence that we have. If he hears, we have that thing that we've asked him for. Some people, when they pray, their prayer is not a prayer of request. It's complaining. On, on Friday, I was, having a, I was doing a live broadcast of Impacting Your World, which is a prayer program. And somebody called, and she, she said, I've been sending money to my brothers and sisters in my native country, um, I've prayed for them. I've sent them money. But every time they get the money, nothing comes out of what they do. And you know, that's, I've, sown, I've sown seeds. I've prayed. And I keep sending the money. So, and then she stopped. So I said, what's your prayer request? Because all you've done is just tell me what hasn't worked. You've not told me what your request is. And so some people, when they go to God, that's how they go. They tell God all the things that are wrong, but no request. They don't tell him what they want, what they want God to do specifically for them. So when Jesus encountered this man, he asked him, do you want to be well? Do you know what the man's response? He said, I don't have anybody to help me. Is that what Jesus asked him? He said, do you want to be well? I don't have anybody to help me. I have no man. When the water is dead, no man comes to help me. 
you saw, even if he didn't know that Jesus was, he didn't know that Jesus was a healer. He didn't know. But I think Jesus looked like a man that could carry somebody, didn't he? Couldn't he have said, yes, I want to be well. Can you help me? He complained instead of making a request. And that's what some people do. So they'll say, I prayed all night. They didn't pray all night. They complained all night. Praise the Lord. So, you know, like one, one, one minister says, they say, don't use your all night to try and intimidate God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. So, but Jesus told him something. I think Jesus had mercy on him and said, okay, carry your bed and walk. And the man just responded. He just stood up, carried his bed and walked. And he was healed. And you know, that happened on the Sabbath. The Bible says, now let me read from verse 14. John chapter 5 from verse 14. Are you there? It says, afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing Come unto thee. I thought it was Jesus that healed him. I thought since Jesus healed him, it should be permanent. Why did Jesus have to tell him, there's something you have to do to keep it? Let me read it in, in the Living Translation. It says, but afterwards Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well. Don't sin as you did before. Or something even worse may happen. Now, Jesus was talking about sin because Jesus knew that it was sin that caused the man's trouble. For some people, it's not sin. Some people, is their, eating, is their eating habits. You can't continue eating fats. Eh? Every week, you're eating lamb. That's full of fats. You're eating pork. Then something happened to your heart. Then you, you came to a, to a meeting. You got healed. Then after the meeting, you go back to your lamb. And once in a while, you can eat it. But not every day. Huh? You can't go back to those things and say, well, I'm healed. Now that I'm healed, nothing will happen. <laughs> when you clean a house, after three months, you, after two weeks, do you still have to clean the house? For the house to stay clean, even if you did nothing in the house. But that house to stay clean, you have to clean it. The house will not stay clean by itself. It has to be maintained. So that miracle you got, you have to maintain it. And you can't go back to the same lifestyle. I remember a lady who got healed in a meeting with pastor. She had a heart condition. And she got healed. She knew. She was, she was, a, she was a doctor. She, she, she knew she got healed. But after the meeting, she went back to smoking. How many of you, you know that smoking and good heart condition, they don't go together. So she went back to the same lifestyle and the problem came back. Praise the Lord. So Jesus told him, now that you are well. For some people, it's not the eating, it's not the smoking, it's not the drinking. It's not even a sin per se. Sometimes it's just the way you use your mouth. Ah, this thing will kill me. You got healed. Then the next, then the next day, you now said, oh, this headache is killing me. You've gone back to using your mouth the way you used to use it before. You can't do that. You can't go back to your old way of doing things. If th those ways of doing things were not spiritually productive or physically productive. Praise the Lord. So, Jesus told him, and when I, when I read this, it made me realize even more that it's people's responsibilities to keep what Jesus has done, what God has done for them. So some of you, you got healed in your bodies. Some of you, you got feel, healed in your hearts. When I say your hearts, your emotions. Something happened. Many of you testified that something left you. Praise the Lord. And you know that something happened in you and to you. Now, don't go back to the same thing you used to do. That's number one. Now, for some other people, they don't go back to the same thing they used to do. But something still happens. 
And this is where you have to realize that you receive the miracle from God who is a spirit. Remember? So in other words, spirits are real. Is that not true? Spirits are real. Some people don't want to hear about spirits. They feel, you know, we shouldn't talk about them. But they are real. Just as God is real. And Bible says God is a spirit. And there are other kinds. The angels are spirits. So even as they are good spirits, they are evil spirits as well. And the devil is their prince. He's their chief. He's the one that sends them out. Praise the Lord. We have to be aware. A lot of things that happen in this world are, are caused by evil spirits. It's just the reality. Sometimes people don't want to... They think when you talk about it, you're not believing in what God has done. No, you're just being aware of what, what's happening. What you need to do is know how to deal with it when it happens. In the same recording I had on Friday, it was very interesting. A lot of the people that are called in for prayers, they called in because they said that they were going through spiritual attacks. Somebody said, in, 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 she called from Libya, and she said that in their family, they always have premature deaths. You know, when they get married, maybe the husband will die, or the wife will die prematurely, or even a child will die, you know? And she said um, that she has a child, but she wants to have a second child, but every time she, she takes in, she said a worm will come and destroy the baby, and she would miscarry. She said a worm. And I was trying to ask her, what do you mean by a worm? Is it, did the doctor say that there's a worm in your body? You know? And I was with a pastor who was my guest. And you know, when we were talking about it, he said, um, he said she imagines. That's what he said. But she's not imagining it. It's not her imagination. It's not. Jesus, if you read the, if you read the Gospels, Jesus cast out, many of the times he was healing people, he was casting out spirits. A lot of the times that he was, that's what he was doing. Because much of the diseases they had were being caused by evil spirits. Praise the Lord. And the devil works on people's ignorance. So it's not because you become conscious of him. What you become conscious of is who you are in Christ and how to deal with him. Praise the Lord. Okay. So let's look at something that Jesus said. Matthew chapter 12. See, I, I want to help you because I know of people who have received their healing and maybe a week later, the symptoms came back and they didn't know what to do about it. And they, when, they, when the symptoms came back, they felt the sickness had come back. And what they did was that they received the sickness back because they said, oh, it means that I didn't get healed. Oh, it has come back and they received it. They gave into it. You know, and you know, I'm, I'm thankful for something that my husband, Pastor Chika, shared with me a long time ago, before we even got married. And I always, whenever I think about this, I always remember this, his testimony. He was, he was still in university then, he was coming to the UK. And he was in a bus, he put his hand outside the window, and a car hit his elbow. It was bad. He was on the way to the airport. So when he got to the airport, he was in such a bad condition, they almost told him that he couldn't travel. He said, no, I must travel. I must. I mean, he was so determined that he must travel. So they, they allowed him to travel. He said, when he was on the plane, you know, because he used to read, read a lot at that time, he used to read a lot of Kenneth Hagin books. And Kenneth Hagin is a minister that talks about healing and faith, healing and faith. They said to himself, I've been reading all these books. It's time to put the faith to work. So he prayed for his hand. And he said, in that plane, his hand got better. The pain left. His hand was healed. Praise the Lord. And so by the time he got to London, everything was fine. He was fine. Then he said, two days after getting to London, his hand began to hurt again. But you know what? You know, Satan is a, a personality, and the de devil's descent are personalities. They're not always the smartest. Do you know what? The hand that began to hurt was the wrong hand. 
That's how he knew. Because, you know, but thank God, he had also been reading about faith. He said, Satan, you are, you are, you're not very smart. He said, this is the wrong hand. So I always remember that thing. That when those symptoms, sometimes when they come back, not sometimes, I mean, they may come back sometimes, that's what I mean. But every time they come back, is Satan's counter-attack. There's always a counter-attack. Sometimes you've grown to the point in your, in your spirit where he knows, let me just leave her alone. Let me just leave him alone. But when he, when he knows that you're not yet sure of what you've received, sometimes he'll come back with a counter-attack. So what do you do when that happens? For Pastor Chuka, it was the wrong hand. So he already knew what to do and he rebuked it and it left. So for you, if those thoughts come back, those bitter thoughts, if they come back, if those thoughts of regret that you left with God, if those thoughts that have been producing depression, if they come back, or if the symptoms of the pain comes back, what do you do? Let me show you what Jesus said happens to people. Matthew chapter 12, I said, isn't it? Matthew 12. I thank God for our Lord Jesus Christ because he understood these things and he made us ready for them. He made us ready. Now, this is what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. Jesus said this. I am not quoting any other thing but the Bible. He said, when the, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return into my house from whence I came out. He doesn't say, I'll go and look for somebody else to attack. He says, let me go back to where I came from. But he was cast out. He was cast out. And he was looking for rest. He didn't find. He said, let me go back to... Why didn't he say, let me go and look for somebody new to attack? First of all, he's, he's, he's found that person's house comfortable. He's used to, he's, he knows what which buttons to push. He knows which, what, which one will work that you will accept. He's used to you. That's why they are called familiar spirits. Because they are familiar with you. So, he said, then he said, I will return into my house from when I came out. And when he is come, he finds it what? Empty. Swept and garnished. Empty. That's where the problem is. The other part, swept, means cleaned up. Garnished means well decorated. You know, everything has been tidied up. Everything is in its right place. But the problem was that it was empty. There was space for it. It was empty. When we receive our miracle, we must not allow ourselves to be empty. Empty of what? Let's look at it. Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Let me tell you something about the devil. We, we know that our Lord is the extraordinary strategist. Is that not true? But the devil himself is a master strategist. He knows how to plan. He knows how to plot. <laughs> Have you ever watched some films where at the end of the day you found out that everything that happened was a setup? And these were human beings setting up other human beings. Is it not true? You say, eh? Huh? Sometimes the good people that set up the bad people. Sometimes the bad people that set up the good people. But it was a well planned out, convoluted plot. If human beings can do that, Satan that has been here for millennia, you know what millennia is? Thousands of years. He will know how to do it because he studied men. He studied them. He knows what works. That's what the Bible says that we should take on, unto us the whole armor of God. 
that we may be able to withstand the strategies. The strategies. He has strategies. That when he says wiles, that wiles means stratagems. His stra- and his strategy is something that you plan out. Is that not true? So, if he's having strategies, what about us? Let's not be spiritually naive. We're just going, you know, it's a war. The enemy is shooting bullets, and you just come out. You're wearing shorts and a t shirt, and just strolling because you're so unaware that a battle is going on. The Bible says, You take unto us the whole armor, not even a part. And the Bible didn't say God will take it on for you. You I, I tell people, if you're really serious about this thing you want, you will do what you need to do. It's when you're not serious, then you, you have excuses. The Bible says that the slothful man will say that there's a lion in the street. That's why I couldn't go to work. And it might be true. There might really be a lion in the street. But if what he wants to do is really important, you know he'll find a way to circumvent that lion. I've told you about the deacon. Not in Christ's mercy. It was a long time ago. That Sunday, he didn't come to church. So when the pastor asked him, why didn't you come to church? He said it was raining, pastor. That's why I didn't come. So the pastor said one day, <laughs> it was raining so hard. It wasn't a Sunday this time. And the deacon's kind of job was he, he was on wages. And if you don't work, you don't get paid. He was, he was not salaried. He was on wages. He said it was raining so hard that the bridge between the deacon's house to where his work was, was flooding. He said he saw the deacon on the bridge holding the railings, holding them so he could get to work. But the day that there was a drizzle, he said he couldn't come to church. It was raining. So when something is really important to you, you will do what you need to do. Is that not true? It's if you're just you're used to it, you want to manage it, then no problem. But when you say, I want a change, enough is enough. I don't want anything I need to do to make it happen. I'll do it. Then you're where you ought to be. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. Are you there? Okay. We said when the, when the unclean spirit came back, he found the house empty, swept, and garnished. The problem was that it was empty. Look at what the Bible says here. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Some people say, but pastor, it's not, I study the word. I read. I have the tapes. I have the books. It's not that I'm not studying, but I still have this problem. We've been talking about meditation. We talked about Joshua. Joshua was 80 years old. And he was an army commander. And he had been sent to take a hostile land full of giants. When he said, we, are, we have come to take the land. Did you think the people were saying, oh, God sent you to take the land? He told, so he told Abraham 430 years ago that the land is yours. Oh, come in and take the land. Do you think that's what they said? Imagine somebody comes to your house and knocks and says, God said I should take your house. What would you do? Police. 999, isn't it? That's what you will call immediately because you know that this person has come with trouble. So, but God knew that Joshua needed something to succeed. So he told him, he said, first, first of all, he told him, be strong and courageous. Then he said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. And meditation is not reading. Meditation is not listening to the tapes. Meditation is not watching the video. So yes, you have the, the, the books. Yes, you have the tapes. Yes, you have the video. But the Bible says meditate. And to meditate means that you will imagine that word. You will visualize it. For example, when the Bible says we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above all principalities, power, might and dominion. You have to see in, your, in, the, in the mind of your spirit. You have to see 
Christ seated. Your imagination must be involved. And then you see yourself seated with him. When you begin to see it, you will begin to change. So when the Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you, it's about the word of Christ changing you. It's not about you being able to quote it. It's not about you being able to quote the whole tape. Or you've read the book from back to front. But it hasn't taken root. You're not seeing that book in you. You're not seeing it. The Bible says, when we behold as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are changed. When you begin to meditate, let me tell you something that happened to me. I told you, I, I told you my story about how I used to be so afraid. I was very fearful. Very, very fearful. And timid. But beyond the timidity, I was fearful. I was so fearful that if I was, if I was having my bath and washing my face, I would do it with my eyes open. Because I didn't want anything to come and get me when I closed my eyes. Can you imagine? I had to sleep with the lights on. And that was a real problem for me. Because I lived in Nigeria. Where there was problems with electrical power. So you couldn't say if that night. Most, most nights you didn't have electrical power anyway. And I couldn't sleep with the lights off. So imagine. My life was an interesting life. I would, I would put the lamp on lantern you know those lanterns that you see it must be on through the night and you know what it was sometimes used to create problems for me because when the smoke when it gets smoky it will cover the the glass so when you wake up in the night you'll see all all sorts of shadows (laughs) So, (laughs) so that used to even create more problems for me sometimes i look at the week the week is looking orange and i will say oh that's a demon eye you know i was just I was full of fear. Sometimes I would sleep with a candle, even though I knew it was dangerous. I said, there must be light when I sleep. So then I, I gave my life to Christ. And, you know, I, I never really prayed about the fear. It wasn't as if I said, Lord, this fear, take it away. You know, I never really prayed about it. But I was receiving the word. I was receiving the word. I couldn't go to dark places. You know, you say you're walking through maybe... The campus when I was in university, walking through the campus, and there's some places that were just covered with plants or canopy or you know, isolated dark places. Mm-mm, not me. And but something happened. We had, I had a group of friends that we used to go and pray every Monday night. And these particular people, they like to go and pray in the sports center, but this, in the in the bu- in the bushy, almost forest part of the sports center. So, but because I was surrounded with people, I didn't really mind because they were there. Then one day, they said, meet us there. <laughs> they didn't know that I was having all these issues with fear and all that. They just said, meet us there. Because I usually used, would go with two of them or three of them. But, you know, around that period, I had been meditating. And I didn't even know that it was meditation. But I had been thinking and talking to myself about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, where it says that... Um, through us, the manifold wisdom of God will be made known to principalities and powers. So, I was thinking about, I said, wow. So, I said, through me, God will use me to show principalities and powers, his manifold wisdom. When I, when I, as I kept on, and I was saying it to myself, I was walking by myself in the night, in the dark, in dark corners, and I was repeating this word, not because I was, I, I didn't even remember where I was. All I could see was this word. I said, that means... I'm greater than them. Something happened in me. A a realization came. A a light came. There was like a dawning in me. And I knew that that day I changed. And so, as I was saying it, I passed the dark corner. It was when I passed it, I said, oh, is it me that just passed this place? Without any fear. And that was it. From then on, if you like Put the light on, put the light off. In fact, please put the light off. I want to sleep. But I hadn't prayed about it. The word changed me. As I looked into the glory of the Lord, I was changed. So, for you, when we talk about meditation, 
it's you saying, even if it's going to take me two hours to get there, I will do it. If it's going to take me four hours meditating this word or, re- or, or this book I'm reading and there's a particular chapter in it or there's this message I'm listening to and I, I will pause the message and meditate on what I've heard and then play it back again and pause it and play it back again until the light dawns in my spirit. The Bible says, let the word of God, dwell, the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Because when it dwells in you richly, it takes over. Then you are changed. You are transformed. And is that transformation Satan fears? Because you can't go back. You know when something changes states? You know when in physics they say there's a, something, is it still the same, same substance, but it undergoes a change of state? When it undergoes a change of state, in some cases it can go back, like water. It can turn to gas, then you can condense it to turn to water again. But there are some things that don't go back. Once they've undergone a change of state, there is no going back. So when you get to that point with the word of God, a point comes, you undergo a change of state. You don't go back. And this is what God is saying. This is what you have to do. So if you received your miracle, yes, you have it. But you, to keep it, you must be changed. Yes, the situation has changed. But you must be changed. That's how to keep it. Praise the Lord. So Jesus said, he, the unclean spirit comes back. Let me read another scripture for you. Let's go to First Peter. You know, as I'm sharing this with you, something is happening in you. Your spirit is taking the word. Because you know that scripture that we read, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teaching and admonishing one another. That's what I'm doing with you. And that word teaching is not the one that you teach yourself. It's the one where people come, I've checked the word. It means when you discuss with another person for the purpose of instructing or teaching them. So that's what I'm doing with you. So now as I'm doing with you, the word of God is entering into you now. And it's taking root in you. Praise the Lord. Now, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. This is what it says. It says, be sober. When it says be sober, it doesn't mean be serious in, you know, it says stop laughing, be sober. No. Joy is part of the, the Bible says the kingdom of God is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So laughter is important. Being happy is important. But when it says be sober, it means be calm and collected. Don't be anxious. Don't be agitated. Be calm and collected. That's actually the word, what that word means. Be sober. Not, not in, if you read Oxford Dictionary, it doesn't, it doesn't say that. But the Greek that the word came from in this one, it means to be calm and collected in your spirit. So it says, be sober, be vigilant. What does it mean to be vigilant? There's even a, there's a, there's a posture of vigilance. It means you are alert. You're on the lookout. Why? Because you are aware something might be happening. You know, you don't, want, you don't want to have a security guard in the night. A lot of times, when do we have our security guards? In the night. You don't want the security guard who in the night is sleeping. That's why you paid him. You paid him to be awake. So that you could sleep. Is that not true? Because you need him to be awake. When it says be vigilant, it means be watchful. Because you are aware something might happen. So then he says, why? Because your adversary, the devil. So who's your, who's your adversary? It's not that woman in the village. It's not your boss. It's not that co-worker that's always saying mean things about you. Your true adversary is the devil. Then look at what it says. As a roaring lion. A roaring lion. In other words, he's making noise. He's making his presence known. He's not quiet. And a roaring lion, why does a lion roar? To, bring, to produce fear. To produce fear. Say, so as the roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Look at the word. It says seeking. Do you, know, you know what it means? It means not, he can't devour everyone. 
But he's looking for somebody who's in the right condition for him to devour. Then look at what the Bible says. Whom resist? I hope you're looking into your Bible. Whom resist steadfast in the faith? Resist him. So when those symptoms come back, if they do, what do you do? You resist them. You don't give in. You don't accept them. You just say, oh, it has come back again. That means you've received them. You say, no. How do you resist? You stand against it. You say, no. You know, we live in, in, in gentle times. Some of you have never fought before, physically. How many of you have ever, have ever fought physically before? Huh? Are you serious? Who are you fighting? Okay, who, who's fought before? But the said, come and tell us who you fought. <laughs> Let's hear, who did you fight? <laughs> did you win? <laughs> Okay, thank you, Pastor. Okay, I've fought uh, m- many people, you know. I don't want to. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, when we were young, we used to challenge each other, you know, like, who's the, who's the best, you know. And, you know, and normally, a, a lot of times, I've fought with people who were bigger than me. And mm-hmm. I fought them. But there was one time, okay, I saw somebody, you know, it was like, he was a guy, he was a man. He's like, he was like five years older than me. So he was harassing this girl in a show. In a shop nearby where I stay, so he was just harassing her, harassing her, and I told her him, you know, stop doing what you are doing, you know. So the other time he meets me, and then he said, "What were you saying?" So he started fighting me, but I beat him, and, I, <laughs> <laughs> and then we are near the shop. I knew some old people came from the shop to stop me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jonathan Vincent. So you won that one, eh? You beat him. Uh-huh. That's what I'm talking about. Not, leave me alone. No. Leave me. Leave me. Uh-uh. You say me? Huh? You open your eyes wide. You see, when you're dealing with an adversary, you're not gentle. You're not gentle. And you, you, like I said, you don't say, Satan, leave me. So Satan, you're a liar. It doesn't work. The Bible says resist him. It's serious. You're determined not to be defeated. You are going to withstand. You, you refuse. That's what it means. That's what it means to, you know, some because you're talking to Christians. Christians are gentle. They're gentle. They're so gentle. When it comes to the devil, don't be gentle. Don't be gentle. When it comes to other people, somebody calls you up on the street, you are driving. Don't say, go with God. Even though you are trying to say something else. Just tell them, go with God. <laughs> but when it comes to dealing with things to do with your health, ah, you get a, you get a, a negative report. Hmm. Mm-mm. Not this body. You can't stay. I refuse to accommodate you. You resist it. The Bible says, whom resists steadfast in the faith. That's not the time to say, hey God, why is, why is all this thing happening to me? Oh God, I pay my tithes. I come to church. I don't know why. I don't know why. That's not time. That's not the time. It's the time to let God in you arise. The Bible says, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. And God is in you. Let him arise. They tell you all sorts of bad news. You say, oh, but Lord, we just finished having a miracle service. It was when, after Jesus was baptized by John and the heavens opened. The Bible says the Spirit of God came upon him. The, the God spoke from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. After that great sign and wonder, the Bible says Jesus was driven by the Holy Ghost into the wilderness, not to fast, even though he fasted. The Bible says to be tempted. It was after that temptation came. But so some people, it's after you had a glorious experience that temptation will come. And what did, what did Jesus use to resist the devil? The word. The word. So if that's what Jesus used, that's what you will use. 
You will not use tears, it will not work. You will not use, you cannot start pitying yourself, it will not work. You will not start calling your friends and complaining, it will not work. It will not work. None of those things will work. Jesus used the word. If our Lord and Master used the word, you have to use the word. And so that means the word of Christ has to be in you richly. Let me show you something else. John, I'll, I'll round up with this. James chapter 5. Sorry, James chapter 4. Verse 7. So the, the two things you will take away from here is that you will meditate the word. There's a book that we have called How to Re Receive a Miracle from God and Retain It. You people that came out to share your testimonies on Sunday, you took the first step by sharing your testimonies. There's something about sharing your testimony. It actually produces more miracles. I've noticed that when people come to me and share a testimony with me or send me an email with a testimony or they, even while they are sharing their own testimony for themselves, something happens to them. Sometimes I end up having a word, an extra word for them just because they came to share their testimony. Just like Jesus said about those 10 lepers. He said, 10 of you got healed. How come only one came to give thanks? Praise the Lord. Then look at what it says here. James chapter 4 verse 7. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Then he says, resist the devil. What will the devil do? <laughs> will he say, I'm not going? Will he say, I'm coming back? He says, you resist. God does not need to resist the devil because the devil is nothing to God. Who does the devil challenge? It's us. So you resist him. You have to stand up bold. And by the time you speak, when you speak, when you meditate and you change, by the time you speak, those words you speak will be words of power. And I'll close with this testimony. I shared it with you before, but I'm going to share it again because I know it will help some people. Several years ago, it was almost about 10, yeah, about 10, 11 years ago, we went for a conference. It was a pastor's conference. And in the, in the, during the break, we went back to the hotel room, Pastor Chuka and I. So Pastor Chuka was on the bed. I think he was praying or something. Well, I stood up and I began to pray because I was preparing for the evening service. And as I was praying, I began to confess the word out. I began to just speak the word. I was speaking the word. I was speaking the word. So I noticed after a while that Pastor Chuka was no longer praying. He was just looking at me. So I just continued because I was going... Yeah, you know, I was going up and down. I was pacing up and down the room. So when I finished, he said, come. So I went to him. He said, you know what? He said, while you were going up and down, confessing the word, he said, I saw a man following you. He said, a short man wearing white. And he said, as you were going up and down and confessing the word, he kept on saying, please stop talking. Please be quiet. Please stop talking. Of course, I didn't hear him. I just continued. So it taught me something. Satan is tormented when we speak the word. When we speak with conviction and we speak it with power. The Bible even says the demons believe and what? Tremble. So that word you're speaking, that word in your mouth, Jesus said, my words... They are spirit and they are life. His words are life. His words are what we need. So God told Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Don't let anything silence you. That you get to the point you're not speaking the word. Don't let anything silence you. That thing that has been an ongoing thing in your life, you can steal the enemy. Steal him by you changing by the word and by you speaking, the, speaking, it, speaking 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 it. You're not even speaking it to anybody. You're speaking it to yourself and to God. You're using it to thank God. You're using it to praise God. The Bible says Abraham was strong in faith. 
giving glory to God. Your mind is on the word. You said, I refuse to recognize anything. The Bible says, Abraham did not consider his own body now dead. Even the deadness of Sarah's womb. But he was strong in faith. So you say, I'm not going to consider anything. He said, these thoughts I rebuke. Get out. Resist. The symptoms, you do not belong here. Leave my body in the name of Jesus. And you speak the word. When Jesus cast out the devil, did he ever grab a man and shake the devil out of him? He never did it physically. So, how the Bible says he cast out the spirits with his word. So when you, when you say, when the Bible says resist, it's not, Satan, I give you upper court. Mm. Is there anything like lower court? I don't know, but there's upper court. You know, some people, when they pray, they say, I'm kicking the devil. They kick him. They say, I'm giving him a punch. Mm. It doesn't work. He's a spirit. Jesus never gave him an upper court. So when he says resist the devil, you resist him with the word of God. The word has so much power. And the word in you. See, God, God will not speak until you speak. When you are quiet, God is quiet. So I say, well, let God arise.